Philip, thank you so much for coming to talk You're to welcome. us about the wonderful Isabella Blow. Tell me a little bit about how you first met Isabella and how she came into your life, because you had a very special relationship with her. Yes, I am. Um, I met. I made. I was a student at the Royal College, mm. and um, Michael Roberts was doing a story called The Green Hat, and I didn't really understand until later that people are superstitious about green hats, so mm. they couldn't find a green hat, so I made a green hat. And when I, after the shoot, I went to Tatler office. I'd never been to a fashion office ever before, so it was all a little bit daunting and like a movie. Mm. And, uh, and then, the art director said, oh, you must meet Isabella. And Isabella walked in and she, this was at a moment when people were wearing power suits to work or sort of like suits with pearls mm -hmm. or, you know, a red suit or a white suit or from everyone, but mostly in navy. <laughs> and Isabella was in quite a subtle look for Isabella, I discovered <laughs> later, but she was in kind of this kind of transparent John Galliano top and a little kind of skirt and Manola, these beautiful shoes and crooked lipstick. And, and she looked at me and she said, um, she wasn't overly friendly. And she said, you look like a naughty thing to me, which <laughs> mortified me because I wasn't then. then. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And so I didn't really think anything of it because she wasn't, she, I remember thinking she looked completely different to everybody else. But I remember distinctly thinking that she looked like all those aristocratic, she had that aristocratic mm. 20s look of all those people that I was kind of fascinated by mm. as a student, like Diana Cooper or anybody mm. of that kind of era. And. Uh, I didn't really think anything of it, and at that moment, I was in, uh, I was a, supplying Harrods hat department with hats through via the college studio, which mm -hmm. is this little corridor, and there was a temp uh, girl called Helen there. So it was very quiet in the college, and so every morning I'd come in, she'd say, "This very unusual woman is trying to track you down," <laughs> and but on the telephone, so I was, I thought. I don't really know very many people and uh, and she wants to know what your schedule is like for the next six months so I thought that was quite unusual and it turned out that Isabella was getting married and I she wanted me to make her wedding headdress and I thought she meant a white bride <laughs> and a veil so I thought okay I'll try but she had other ideas in terms of she was wearing purple and she had this uh, jeweled kind of necklace uh, embroidery and her idea was kind of Eleanor of Aquitaine and so it was getting more and more unusual as time progressed and then I she said think of something so I love uh, this image from a famous play a 20s play called The Miracle and it's where Diana Cooper the actress played and she wore this kind of amazing look. She was like a, a, a Madonna character mm. but like the religious Madonna not the other one <laughs> and uh, so uh, I nervously went to Elizabeth Street to Isabella's house and when I got there um, my heart sank because there was two men with her, one very large black man and one very serious, not serious looking, but just very distinguished looking Englishman. And I thought, shit, they're going to put a dampener on my idea because I thought they're not going to like this. And they were so over the top in their enthusiasm that I was a little stunned. Mm -hmm. But I'd never heard of Manolo Blahnik or Andrew and Tally. <laughs> and so I, I, it was a little bit like, really? That you, it's, and they were, you know, over enthusiastic about mm. it so and that's how I met Isabella and I basically when you met when you kind of inter in, you know, interacted with Isabella it was like having an affair I just loved her and she was very kind 
at that moment to me and she'd come and visit mm. me at the college and we'd go shopping for ecclesiastical lace because I liked that kind of thing and she liked that and so you know there was a whole kind of romance going on around the wedding mm. and and her kindness was remarkable mm. and I remember during one of the fittings for the dress somebody asking her um, saying Isabella why are you having the student make your wedding headdress because you know you could have anybody and she just basically that didn't register with Isabella mm. you know she would not she didn't really think on that level she wasn't interested in the most important or the most heightened she was interested in you mm. and that was her her magic because she she made you feel like she, her expectations of what you were about to do for her were so high that you rose to the occasion mm. and that happened throughout my whole experience with Isabella. She would never tell you what to do. She always, um, she thought it was really tacky to tell somebody, a, a creative person what to do. Mm. She would, one time she interfered in a hat <laughs> and she never did it again and uh, it was a hat afterwards that basically she wanted a Balenciaga style hat with a mortar board mm -hmm. and uh, so I said like how big do you want the hat and she was like well big so I was <laughs> like okay and then her friend Lucy Ferry told me that when she wore it this charity lunch she couldn't get in the door <laughs> so she had to maneuver herself around the party <laughs> sideways like that so but Isabella was capable of things like that and mm. she was she was the only person with the hat on at this event and um, her wedding was uh, one of the most amazing experiences for somebody when you're 22 mm. and you've never met very many English people and I got really nervous when she sort of suggested that I should get me a helicopter <laughs> from to go to fly to Gloucestershire. She had a friend who had a helicopter and I was like, oh my God, like, you, you can't because then people <laughs> think that I asked her for the helicopter. So I was like, no, 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 I'll go on the train. So I remember going to Gloucestershire to, uh, on a Saturday morning early on the train, arriving in Stroud, which is the most beautiful station. Mm. And then I think I was picked up by Amory, her brother-in-law, and I was astonished by what I saw mm. when I got there. Um, Amory gave me this kind of tour of the estate. There was some, you know, wild murals going on in cottages and people in robes, mm. and it was just amazing. And I thought all English people must be like this. But what I didn't realise was I'd hit on the one scenario mm. that um, was, they were just exceptional and different. And, and it was a group of people. It wasn't, she fit in perfectly with them because, mm. um, you know, not very many daughter-in-laws, uh, not very many mother-in-laws want what the daughter-in-law is wearing. Mm. So her mother-in-law was, very interesting. She was like a sort of movie star character. Mm. And Selena, you know, arrived in a top hat that was, you know, this tall. <laughs> and, and I always remember, you know, getting, preparing her for the, uh, getting her ready. And I sort of wrapped her up in kind of chiffon first. And then she was sitting there with her father kind of, uh, in the room and he was the most aristocratic person I'd ever seen because he just had that look mm. and she was you know in her underwear with a sort of you know wrap on with a gold crown and she was like daddy daddy what do you think and he just said he just looked and he said marvelous <laughs> and she was in her underwear so it was just it was like this this it was getting better and better and better and when I got to the cathedral, uh, I always remember the f expression on the faces of the people 
who were watching, uh, who would come to look at the wedding outside, they were expecting a white mm. bride. And when Isabella appeared, their expressions, they were just stunned because they just didn't understand what was happening. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the wedding, and the, I mean, the music and her, and the, I made these knights helmets for the little boys because <laughs> she wanted knights. Uh, helmets and it was all kind of medieval theme and the ca- sound of the cathedral and the sound of the organ and the look and it was just breathtaking mm-hmm. and also I'd never seen a more amazing collection of people because mm-hmm. it was it was a movie mm-hmm. right happening in front of you and um, the day after the wedding I remember thinking I'm going to miss her because that was the most wonderful experience and now it's over. And then the next day she called me from honeymoon saying, what's the next hat going to look like? So it never ended. Why did she love hats so much? What was it about them? Because you said you know, she was at a party and no one else was wearing a hat. And you also said something lovely before we went live. You said you know, she didn't just love things. She was obsessed by them, and I love that obsession. Yeah, some, sometimes pe- you know people will say, you know, I like that dress or I like that skirt. Isabella didn't like something. She was she loved. If she liked something, she loved it. Mm. Isabella had the unbelievable um, capacity to uh, to clap solo, looking like the most incredible bird <laughs> in a tent in Paris with 4,000 people in black and she could, if she saw something that she liked, she could just <laughs> and the whole place would be quiet. But she liked, if she liked it, but she wasn't showing off. She was just, she believed in the, that's what it was about. Mm. You know how bored people look at fashion shows? Mm. Well, I always think the wrong people are looking at the fashion shows that if the general public saw them, they just love them. Yeah. Isabella and hats, she, she, you know, she always had an obsession with hats when forever, I think. I, I've seen photographs of her, you know, when she was younger and there was always like a bow or something mm. or... Uh, I think she just understood that hats were an emotive accessory that people responded to. Mm. And this was at a moment when basically um, my sort of co fellow students at the Royal College, they thought that it was unusual that I wanted to make hats because they thought only old ladies wore mm-hmm. hats. So Isabella, you know, didn't think like anybody else. And she, you know, there's nothing more English than a hat. Yeah. And so it was like, it was the. Just the one most wonderful situation because she moved me into the basement of her house mm. so I was you know making the hats and then Isabella would go out in the hats so Isabella was very social I wasn't interested in going out so I was at home making the hats and then Isabella would come downstairs and you'd hear this clip clop clip clop clip clop clip <laughs> down these stairs and then she'd say okay who's going tonight <laughs> and she saw the hats as Personalities yeah, and people, to them in third person. and she'd refer to them, and so you know, and then she'd come back and she'd say, you know, she had she had the most fantastic dance at Annabelle's <laughs> last night, and you know, just we we, she kind of fed my love of hats because she was obsessed as obsessed with hats as I was, and this was at a moment when I had no customers mm. at all, and it took quite a while for people to come round. To, well, it didn't take it. It's just that they just didn't look like what everybody else was wearing. Mm. And I saw other possibilities with hats. And she, um, she encouraged me with them. She just thought, fantastic. And she loved, we loved, we loved the hats that nobody else would go near. So they were our obsession. And what used to irritate her in later years is basically she'd say, who the fuck is wearing my hat? (laughs) Because if she saw somebody sort of, uh, you know, in a magazine that Mm. looked vaguely something like she had been wearing. Isabella's brief for a hat was very difficult. 
So she liked something that had never been seen before, <laughs> that had never seen, no one ever seen anything like it, and in the most extraordinary material. So it was always, and she couldn't describe what she was looking for. So it was always <laughs> a really complex brief. It was like climbing a mountain every time you made a hat for Isabella because she didn't, you know, she, she just expected so much from you that you delivered it mm. because the thought of disappointing her was just out of the question. So, you know, she would never in a million years say, I don't like that hat. She, uh, you would just, you know, she would kind of steer clear of what she'd call the commercial ones. <laughs> and we just had a lot of fun together. Mm. And she liked, she used, to, she used to refer, she saw herself as an older woman and me as a young child. So she used to say, we're like Harold and Maud. You know that movie? Mm. And she would always insist that I, she had kind of like a, I can't, I don't know anything about cars, so I can't really describe her. It's like, you know, an ordinary kind of station wagon mm. car, but she always insisted that I sat in the back. <laughs> and she would, she loved kind of, you know, putting on the accelerator and then just really, so she was just, she, she was just so much fun, mm. Isabella. Isabella was the most entertaining, witty character I've ever met. She could have done stand up in Vegas and been <laughs> the biggest success because Isabella was kind of alarming at best of times. You're never quite sure what she was going to say mm. or to whom or what about. Mm. So, you were always completely on your toes. You know, when I first met Isabella, and this was in a moment when people weren't wearing that, I mean, people were wearing hats, but not mm -hmm. out and about. And I always remember, you know, when I'd go, if, when, if I went to a restaurant with her, I'd have to sort of really brace myself <laughs> before we go in, because Isabella would just march in, which I loved about her, and she'd just walk in like it was, she just didn't see how people reacted. And she mm. wasn't looking for their reaction because clothes and hats and how she dressed, it was a personal experience for her. Mm. She enjoyed the clothes. You and don't enjoyed think she used it as armour in any way? She did, but she used to joke about uh, that she was ugly and she needed to cover mm. herself. But she didn't really feel that because no woman really... She, she just... She she just found fashion entertainment. She found it entertaining. And she used to sort of, you know, if people admired something that she was wearing, a dress or a hat, or they'd say, your dress is amazing, she'd say, isn't it? Mm. She wouldn't say, oh, you know, most people would say, oh, really, do you think so? Or really, mm. or I don't think, or make some kind of, you know, she'd say, isn't it incredible? So she, you know, she, her passion for, you know, young, creative people was uh, amazing mm. and she her belief in you was what carried us mm. you know she felt after she met Alexander that she had discovered the next Yves Saint Laurent okay mm. which was a big statement, big statement at that moment and she was right mm. and she she loved. She was. She loved people. Mm. People. She was. People responded very well it to her. She poured herself into people. Completely, well. and it, Isabella was like a tonic. You know, life was fun when you were with Isabella. Just walking down the street, mm. going shopping, going on the bus it would be an event. Something would happen, or. You know, we liked kind of similar kind of things. We liked kind of going to Watts, ecclesiastical suppliers. <laughs> and um, I w one time I went to visit her when I was making her, when the wedding was approaching, and she was in the kitchen downstairs cooking with a frying pan in kind of Catholic priest vestments, <laughs> but like the whole deal. And she told me she'd worn it to a fancy dress party and that her cousin had just freaked out because they were Catholic and just said, this is too much. <laughs> and, uh, but Isabella didn't really think on that level and she didn't really mind what anybody thought. She, she just loved to um, enjoy clothes. Mm. I mean, she was obsessed with, but not in a kind of, 
you know, silly way, mm. in a very cultured way. Mm. And she, you know, she, her belief in us was um, astonishing. You know, she brought me to an exhibition, it was 70 years of British Vogue, I think it was 70 years of British Vogue, and it was at the Royal College, and I'd never been to anything like that in my life, and all the designers were there, and all mm. the models, whatever, and and there was like hundreds of people, and she just sort of, you know, touched me like that and said, this way, and she sort of, we went sideways, and she said, follow me, quickly. And she just stood me in front of Karl Lagerfeld and she introduced me to Karl Lagerfeld like she, like she was doing mm. him a favour, not me a favour. And she believed that. Mm. But it was, I, was, I was just stunned, you know, I didn't know what to say to, what, to Karl Lagerfeld. Mm -hmm. And he, was, he had his fan and he was doing a TV show the next day and he was like, what do you think, should I do this show? I was like, I can't believe, you know, six months ago I was in college looking mm. at books with all these kind of incredible designers. So Isabella would help me to relate to those people because I didn't really know how to at 22. Mm. And for example, when Valentino came to visit me, I said, Isabella, you have to be there. Mm. And so I always remember the expression on Valentino's face when he saw Isabella, his pupils just dilated. She <laughs> was like in this long monkey coat mm. with this kind of bicorn hat that I'd made her. And he was just, they just stared at her and she was like, <laughs> absolutely charming with them. She was mm. like, Mr. Valentino, it's very nice to see you. She wasn't like, you know, apologizing for mm. anything. So she was very strong mm. person. She was well able to relate to people. So, uh, you know, he must have been really tickled by her because when I worked on his show, um, he invited Isabella and myself to have tea with him and Joan Collins at the Ritz and I think he was showing Isabella to Joan Collins mm. because and Isabella was in a little kind of pink baby doll number look for Valentino and she loved Valentino mm. because she had a favourite Valentino suit so she kind of helped enormously we went to Paris the first time together mm. uh, she, we went on the then you'd fly there was no Eurostar mm. so and there was a strike when we got to to Orly Airport and we had to go by bus into Paris and there was no bus driver on the bus but there was lots of people and Isabella was really fed up with this scenario so she just got into the driver's seat and started revving the engine <laughs> and kept looking at back at me and laughing and the driver was like ak, ak, came running thinking <laughs> but basically the bus moved mm. so we got to uh, Chanel freaked I was she was like she said if you call him sir Gonna be really, she said, do not be, uh, <laughs> what's the word? Subservient? He's subservient. She was, had no time for that whatsoever. Mm. And so we walked into Chanel and they looked at her like she was, they weren't impressed, let's say. They didn't understand that kind of capacity to have, you know, an amazing coat on where all the side was ripped mm. or the zip was broken and it was held together with safety pin. She thought that was fine. Mm -hmm. I thought that was unusual first when I met her. She just thought, I like this dress. Okay, it's broken, but so what? Mm -hmm. And she basically, when we got to Chanel, she just said, we'd like some tea. And they said, well, we don't have any tea. And she said, we'd like some tea. So we got the tea. And uh, we, they, I, everything hat I had was black. Black was our favorite color. Mm -hmm. You know, I love colours, but Isabella used to always say that, you know, black, black, she used to say black velvet, you know, she said it's like Elvis Presley. <laughs> so we loved, I had all these kind of black hats and they were doing black and so suddenly I, you know, straight out of college was doing Chanel Couture mm. because of Isabella. So she, you know, I had to be able to have the capacity to come up with the goods, but mm. she facilitated, uh, everybody's life, all the people that were associated with her. Mm. Sophie Dahl, you know, she invented mm. a career out of thin air for mm. Sophie Dahl. I always remember being on a shoot in, with Ellen von Unworth for Italian Vogue at Hills and Isabella was insisting that they photograph Sophie, naked, 
on the table. <laughs> and Ellen von Anworth, of course, loved it, but the fashion editor was freaking out. And she said, she was just, she was like, but, but, but Isabella, she's fat. And Isabella was like, I don't care, but she's beautiful. Mm. One year later, Sophie's on the cover of Italian Vogue. Mm but with the fight beforehand to try and get her in. So Isabella just made, had a magical way of making things possible for people. I love that you said she made the bus move because it seems like she just made everything. Happen. Well, she just was fed up with kind of having to hang around for some driver who was outside having a mm. cigarette. So she decided she'd drive the bus a little seems bit. Like that's how she lived her life. Yes, she, 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 her speciality was lorries. So, you know, she could drive a lorry or a tractor or any of those things. So she was completely different to every other fashion person I've ever met because the one thing that, that she had that was completely different to everybody else is she had a heart. And that's why people respond to her so well because of her heartiness. I mean, of course, everybody's a heart and there are nice people in fashion business, but fashion people are not known for their heartiness. They're known for their talent, their creativity, mm. their elegance, whatever. But a big heart, mm, not so, it's not foremost when people mm. explain. But, um, but Isabella had a very big heart and, and, you know, she had a huge capacity for love. And when you were in her, um, in her environment, when you were with her, she just made you feel good. Mm. And, and everybody, you know, when she first discussed, when she first told me that she had depression, I said, you're joking. Mm. I said, but you with depression? And she said, no, you don't understand. And I said, but you don't, you're, you're fine. She said, yeah, but I'm not depressed when I'm with you. So, uh, you know, she, she would do this, you know, I know what went on with Alexander as well. She was the same, mm. you know, she just adored him. They adored each other. And so I have no time for all that kind of, you know, uh, searching for conflict between them, you know. They're, they were, you know, it was, it was love. She adored him. You mm. know, she loved, she just thought it was fantastic that he was so unlike what designers were expected to look like mm. or be like. And she he encouraged him hugely. Mm. You know, some of his shows, I used to see Isabella's clothes coming down the runway. He'd remade a version of it, mm. whatever, but like a Poiré coat that she'd had, I'd suddenly see it coming down the wrong <laughs> way. Or I'd see certain things and I'd think, I know who's going to be wearing that. Mm. And her, um, her conviction for him was impressive. You know, it's very easy for now for everybody to sort of... Uh, um, it's very strange for me because uh, these... Isabella and Alexander are sort of like by the minute gaining mythical level of adoration mm. and iconicness or mm. whatever it's called. But I remember when it was completely different. You know, now everybody loves Isabella. Mm. But there was a time when they used to laugh, some people, some people used to laugh at Isabella. Mm. But she didn't see that, but I, I, I saw that. But now everybody loves her. So Isabella kind of, we're, we were obsessed with Marilyn Monroe and uh, Isabella convinced me one day that we needed to buy Marilyn Monroe's fake eyelashes <laughs> at auction and so I called up the auction house and the guy happened to be from where I come from so he mm. let me bid that day and when it got to $40,000, Isabella and I didn't have 4000 between us, <laughs> don't mind, 40000 at $40,000 you know, both of us were like, um, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> and, uh, but Isabella has kind of become, she be, I mean, in my mind, she's kind of become a kind of Marilyn Monroe kind of cat figure of fashion that everybody loves. They don't know why they love her, but they love her, or there's something touching about her. <laughs> and um, she'd be, she'd be, she'd be happy. 
she'd be thrilled because because uh, we loved Marilyn Monroe. It's interesting what you're talking about with love and there's not a lot of love and fashion. I was thinking about it after doing Nick's. It's the first time I've talked about relationships rather than clothes and that's such a huge part of fashion. And yes. It's so beautiful to hear. It's, um... The exhibition is not just about no, it's clothes, not. you know? It's... It's a bit trickier than that. Mm. You see what it's going to... I've seen what it's going to mm. look like. It's a little heavy viewing. Yeah. As far as... Your friends have no idea. They, mm. do, they don't know what it is, but mm. it's not light viewing. Mm. It's brilliant for the people who are going to come and see it, but to people that knew her, it's it's, hard. it's a little tricky. Mm. So I am dreading it. Yeah. Are you <laughs> going to go to the opening? Or are you going to yes, because it's too wussy not, not to. Too. Fuck hard, it, yeah. you know? And that's she, what her attitude would have been. Wasn't yeah. Okay. And so, you know, she never, she would, she did, she did, she never, she did everything she could mm. for me. So I'm trying to, you know, Do what you can. pay her back. Five days before she died, I had a conversation with her in hospital. And she, without, without any, without a self-pity in any tone, she felt that she didn't matter anymore. Mm. And so this exhibition proves her wrong, yeah. and I'm happy about that because she did. She, she she's always going to matter now. Mm. But she felt so low that you know people don't like to talk about those kind of things. But unfortunately, those kind of things are what people are part of people's lives, and fashion is about gloss, mm. and Isabella went beyond gloss. She, she gave you everything, the gloss, the lows, the highs, everything. And she wasn't a sort of moany person. Mm. The delivery was with hilarity. Mm. So it was a little alarming mm. when one would have Isabella explaining to you why she thought it was a good idea. Mm. And trying to convince you that it was okay. Mm. So... There was quite a lot to process mm. when you're... When it's someone you love. When it's someone like that. But, uh, but you know, uh, when I think of her, I think of her laughing. She, we laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed about everything. She didn't care for the kind of high priests of style or fashion. I mean, she, there were people she mm. adored. There were you know, she'd worked with, whatever. She was more interested in kind of, you know, somebody she'd met on the bus who she liked something mm. about them or, you know, she, she, it was just an amazing collection of people that she just kind of collected and just instinctively liked them and, mm. and suddenly, but, and you know, if you didn't like them immediately, she was disappointed. So if you didn't fall in love with the person that Isabel had found on the bus, it could be a little it got to her. tricky. Yeah. So um, she, uh, she made our lives fun and interesting and she brought it all, she made it real mm. and she gave a reality to a very unreal industry because to young people it's like daunting. Mm. And so, and she was like, forget it, just get out there and mm. get going. So she gave us confidence and she gave Alexander confidence. She, you know, she gave us all so much, you know, we're not the most confident people mm. really in here, but she made you feel confident or she'd talk you up or she'd introduce I mean mm. she'd you know embarrass the hell out of you mm. in front of people and you know that kind of person is very very rare I mean what's extraordinary is that uh, she taught me something very very important and that you know to encourage a young person is wonderful 
because young people need encouragement when they're starting out. Mm. And they need help. And many people who are in a position to help young people um, choose not to, maybe. Mm. But Isabella made it her business to help everybody. Mm. And not in a kind of Samaritan's kind of way, but basically if, she, if you were in her focus, basically she, you felt a million dollars. She made, you feel, she made you feel like you could do anything. So she gave Alexander the confidence to be, to also be the person he was mm. because she, you know, there was a moment when she was devastated after one of his shows because people were saying things like, well, maybe he should do costume design. And she was like, costume? Mm. And, you know, they were, I always remember she made, you know, she brought me to his show, the Highland Rape show. Mm. And, you know, it was, it was, it was incredible, this show, because it was a vision. It was mm. one singular vision. But I remember the reactions on the faces of the ladies in the audience. They <laughs> were, I mean, I can still see their faces. They just, you know, they didn't want to like it. No. And she just kept on and on and on and on and on and on and on to people. Like Roberts, Anna Winter, everybody. She just said, there's this boy who is amazing. Mm. And they used to think, uh, okay, Isabella, but she was right. Mm. So it's, it's, you know, show studio does that. They help people, mm. yeah? And that's admirable because when you're in a position to help somebody, many people don't bother. She's not too. And uh, she wasn't like that. I loved that about her. So. And, it, and, and you know what, it, it makes you feel good mm. when you help somebody on their way because it's, uh, it's the most wonderful feeling if mm. you can make something happen for somebody. Do you try and see the world through her eyes? Completely. Mm. Completely. She, you know, we kind of lived together for years. I'd have a flat, Dabber and Isabella would come and live with me or then I'd live with them. It was, you know, she was like our mum mm. to, to me and Alexander. She used to look after us. And, uh, and that's why it resonates now, big in the world. Everybody in the world knows who Isabella Blow is now. And she'd love that. <laughs> She would, she, you know, she, it, she yes, she, you know, it would have made her feel good, you know? And I think it's due payment for everyone she helped as well, that we all are giving something back. That's the most wonderful thing about the whole experience, that basically everybody that's involved with it has been so giving mm. for their own personal reasons. But everybody, mm. everybody has, you know, Exhibition catalogues usually look pretty awful, mm. don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, how wonderful mm. to for Nick to do that for her. Mm. But he's has he's a real person too. Mm. <laughs> so it's you know it's a magic. Isabella had a magic that you know. I the only shame is that you know. Half an hour with Isabella, you know, is... She's wonderful. Yes. Thank okay. You. You're welcome.